Because there's no other ones. She did a little bit, and then I, and I think you can do that tomorrow. So she's already doing it. Oh, hey, hello, hello, everyone. Time to circle up and start thinking about A and P exam. Or sorry, A and P exam. No, A uh, and P as a topic. Um, a note about your exams. Great job. Congratulations. Uh, looked really good. Uh, we hit my secret goal of every time, which is to beat Dr. Schlater's class. So woo -woo. Uh, so don't tell them that's in our YouTube recording, um, but, but looking good. If you have um, questions or trouble, uh, I made the link to my bookable office hours more visible on Brightspace. So that's now under the, the important links. Sorry, I didn't realize it was kind of hidden away in the syllabus. So I can go over specific questions you missed with you. So go ahead and do that. Um, or in general, if you want study tips, study techniques, or just to come sort of talk through some topics with me individually as we move forward, that's a, a great way to do that. Um, those of you who have visited my office before know uh, it's, it's kind of cozy. I got a bunch of armchairs, some candy. I like to talk. I don't know if you guys have noticed, so um, come visit me <laughs> uh, if you're comfortable. I Well, I guess really what I'm saying to you is I did not go to a single office hour as a student because I thought you only went if someone died and something was dire as a professor. I now really regret that. That's not the case. The people who do come to office hours with me do just like kind of talk through stuff. We study, we try and find gaps in knowledge. So that is a totally appropriate use of office hours is the sort of PSA. Okay, sorry, personal life advice. Okay, but we are going to finish up thinking about blood before we move into the respiratory system for this unit. Uh, so what we covered so far, we talked about kind of within the blood, the composition of the blood, some of that plasma, some of the proteins. We really talked about our erythrocytes and their life cycle. So those red blood cells, which will be coming back as we think about gas exchange in this unit. We have a packet on leukocytes. We're going to have that um, do and then go over it for Monday. I think that should give us enough time, a little bit of a, a rest, but we'll get to that. Uh, at the beginning of next week, I think. So just kind of pair that up with your mastering a and P assignment. So today, what we're really going to focus in on uh, is thinking about platelets and something called hemostasis, which is just keeping your blood in your body, in your cardiovascular system. So that's something that we regulate, right? We don't want our blood escaping. Uh, so we're really going to be talking a lot about how clots work, how we heal cuts today. So this is your reminder that the leukocyte worksheet, we're going to have it due on Monday. So I'll put an assignment up on Brightspace. So if you have it on paper, you can just take a picture and post it so that I know you did it. Um, or you can submit it electronically, and then we'll go over some of that on Monday. Uh, general overview is that our leukocytes are part of our immune system. They function in defense of the body. There's a whole textbook section on the leukocytes that you can use as a reference. And I also think that before our last exam, I updated your slides to include um, all of the old slides that we had with red text on the leukocytes uh, so that you can fill those in for yourself if you want to use slides as a reference instead. Cool. But we're going to zoom in on our concept of hemostasis, because this is the one that uh, we're going to kind of work in a flow chart form, kind of a complex system that we're thinking about. Okay. So when we think about what happens when we get a cut, we're going to think about a series of steps. And depending on how deep you want to go, the list of steps gets longer and longer and longer. If you move forward and you think really in depth about clotting, uh, it will get quite long. So we're going to try and build up from the basics and kind of spread out and sort of tack on more and more knowledge as we go. So we're going to start out by thinking about our platelets, which are these sort of little fragments of cells that are going to be the first part of creating a blood clot. Okay. So when we have our platelets, we're going to be thinking about our initial response to a cut. 
And our first couple of steps are gonna be a vascular spasm. So a spasm, like when you think about a muscle spasm, right? You're thinking about like, right? That's happening in your vasculature. So the smooth muscle in the vasculature, it has a spasm, it starts to contract. Then we're gonna form what we call a platelet plug. And then after we form the platelet plug, we're going to create an actual blood clot, which is gonna be different from the platelet plug. So beginning with that vascular spasm. Okay, cool. All right. So beginning with that vascular spasm. So we're thinking we got in a knife bite, right? And now we got a cut. Okay. So we now have a damaged blood vessel. So the danger to your body when you have a damaged blood vessel is that you are losing blood. Right. So all your initial responses are going to be anything we can do to mitigate that blood loss. So to stop losing blood, to lose as little blood as possible. So the first thing we can do is related to the concepts that we talked about in our last unit. Right. So we talked about the fact that we can vary resistance by varying radius of blood vessels using smooth muscle. And we can change how much blood flow is going to an area. Okay. So if you have a cut, this is useful because you can immediately sort of use this in order to stop having quite so much blood flow to that area. So that's really what the vascular spasm is doing. So we're saying that our blood vessel got damaged and one of its automatic responses to damage is to start to clamp down kind of. So that's the spasm, right? So the blood vessel is constricting so we're creating a lower radius, a smaller radius, therefore higher resistance, therefore decreasing our flow to that blood vessel that has the damage, okay? So this is gonna to begin to minimize blood loss just by having less blood going there, right? So we haven't closed over the hole or the cut yet, but at least um, we've started to make it so that not quite so much blood is going there, it's going other places more. So this is an intrinsic vascular response, meaning that this is kind of an automatic response of the blood vessels themselves. So intrinsic, just kind of automatic of the system itself. Okay. Uh, sympathetic innervation also kind of helps with this. So when we're talking about our sympathetic nerves as relates to our vasculature, uh, we were thinking about that norepinephrine binding mainly to alpha receptors, the alpha adrenergic receptors causing vasoconstriction throughout the body with the exception of our skeletal muscle and our cardiac muscle where we were thinking about beta two receptors. And so, but for our purposes of the vascular spasm, right? We're thinking about that bigger, more, more common pathway where we have the sympathetic nerves giving off their norepinephrine, binds to an alpha adrenergic receptor somewhere that helps with clamping down the blood vessel, right? Constricting vasoconstriction, constricting that radius, increasing resistance, minimizing flow. Okay, so that's our vascular spasm. And as this is going on, uh, our walls of the blood vessel essentially are becoming sticky. So you kind of draw us a little cross section of the blood vessel. So. Just a reminder, so we have, depending what blood vessel it is, we know we have different layers, but we maybe have some connective tissue, we maybe have some muscle, okay. And we have an endothelial layer. The endothelial layer is that inner layer, okay? So when we have a cut, that endothelial layer in the region of the cut is going to start to get sticky to kind of attract platelets. So we're gonna talk about that thing next. So that's what we're talking about, the inner layer. Cool. So a little note about platelets now. So what you have up in the corner is just that uh, big map of how we develop all our different types of blood cells um, from our hematopoietic stem cells uh, that we saw in the bone marrow. So before we trace down this pathway, right? We grabbed that way. We got to our erythrocytes, our red blood cells. Okay. So we're not going to focus on the whole life cycle of a platelet, but they are also coming from those stem cells, right? 
So we'd still start with a stem cell. Now we're going off in this direction, right? So we got these little crunchy little potato chip fragments at the end. Those are our platelets, okay? So our platelets are colorless cell fragments that have broken off a cell called a megakaryocyte. You don't need to know that word, but since it's really small here, uh, reading it out loud for you. So this broke down, gave off these little parts. Those are platelets, they're colorless, they have no nucleus. They do have some organelles and granules in them. And this is gonna be important because uh, they are going to be able therefore to release um, secretions basically, which is going to be important for how they form the platelet plug. So they do have some stuff in there that can release uh, such a kind of like local signals to the surrounding uh, region. Okay, so there are lots of platelets in your blood. They're important for blood clotting as we will see. Okay, so our platelet plug is gonna start to form where we had our blood vessel damaged. Okay, and this is gonna be our next step in decreasing that blood loss, right? So we had our vascular spasm clamping down the blood vessel so we don't have much blood flow going to it. So next we're gonna actually start to cover over the hole. Right? That's, that's the point of the plug. Okay. Right. So we got this in all sorts of forms. So our goal is just to understand how this works. So if you like flow charts, I do recommend redrawing flow charts. If you like pictures, I recommend redrawing to yourself pictures. Uh, any kind of active studying is really good for you and really good for your understanding. You want to take yourself voice notes and then listen to whether your voice note made sense. If you want to talk to a friend, all different kinds of strategies you can try. Um, so if I sound like I'm repeating myself, I am. I'm just showing you different ways you could be learning this. Okay. So we've started out with our blood vessel damage, right? So we got some kind of cut. This is my terrible drawing of a knife. Maybe it's a feather, whatever. Okay. So we have blood vessel damage. Okay. So I'm going to draw a cross section of a blood vessel. Make sure that we have our endothelial layer in there. Okay. Right. So we have damaged this in some way. We've made a cut, right? Okay. So this is going to expose the layer of the blood vessel that's under the endothelium. Um, so from the perspective of the blood, under is kind of out, right? So we're going to expose the subendothelium. And we know that the endothelium here is getting kind of sticky. So now we're kind of zeroing in on this like idea of getting sticky. Okay. So we have something called von Willebrand factor. So that's what this the WF stands for later on here. Okay. So this von Willebrand factor is going to bind to fibers in that exposed subendothelium. So it's going to bind specifically to collagen fibers. Okay. Yeah. And this is going to be basically helping our platelets get attracted to that area of the cut. Uh, so we're going to see that our platelets, because of this von Willebrand factor, are going to adhere to the area of that cut. So adhere is a word that just means, since we have the word sticky on there, I want to avoid repeating it. Um, adhere is to like bind to something, right? If something adheres to something else, you've just kind of like slapped it on there and stuck it on, okay? So we're gonna have platelet adhesion. Those platelets themselves are going to become sticky and then aggregate. Aggregation means like collecting together. So we're gonna have them like stick onto the walls, then we're gonna have them collect other platelets. And then they're gonna secrete some chemicals out that are going to continue this process to continue to build our plug. So we're gonna track through that in a couple other forms, okay? So here we have it in words, and I pulled forward a picture from your book and that I think appears later in your slides just because I love looking at pictures while I'm looking at words. I think it's helpful. Okay. So what we're looking at here, right? so here we see that endothelium layer, right? Those are the cells directly lining and touching the blood, right? So we're looking here at a sort of lengthwise section through our blood vessels. So we got like a blood vessel like this. And we're looking as if we hit a plane through there, right? So we cut it kind of lengthwise. That's what we're looking at right now. Okay. So we have our 
endothelial layer touching our blood, okay? And then if it's damaged, we expose the layer that that endothelium is sitting on. So that's our subendothelial layer or subendothelium. Okay, so sub for like deep to or below, right? So it's just below the endothelium. Okay. Then we have our other layers of our blood vessel. So we'd likely have a smooth muscle layer, depending on what kind of blood vessel we're talking about. Um, some connective tissue probably there. Eventually we have interstitial fluid between that blood vessel and whatever tissue it's traveling through. Okay. So what we can see here, right? When we cut through, we're now basically exposing the blood to all of these layers, right? Since we've cut across it, as the blood starts to leak out, right? It touches the endothelium. It touches the subendothelium. It would even, as it's escaping, right, touch the smooth muscle, the connective tissue, et cetera, right? Because the blood, if we don't clot this over, right, is just going to start leaking out, ending up outside your body or in some internal cavity, right? That's what bleeding is, right? We're escaping from this blood vessel. Okay. So whatever is in your blood can come into contact with each of these layers. I'm saying that. Because on that previous slide, we saw that what is happening with the platelet adhesion, right, is that that von Willebrand factor is letting the platelets uh, bind, basically, to the subendothelium, right? So as the blood is escaping, it has von Willebrand factor in it, and right? it's escaping, it's escaping, but when it touches these exposed collagen fibers as it's trying to leave the blood vessel, this is when it starts to make this layer sticky so that our platelet plug is going to start to form. So that's like in picture form what I was talking about on that previous slide. All right. So we had our platelets adhere because of the von Willebrand factor. So they started to sort of stick onto the wall adhere, right? Okay. And now they're going to begin to aggregate. So aggregation, aggregated, means we now have a collection. So that's referring to the fact that we have now a bigger group, right? So adhering was sticking onto this wall. Aggregation is that we now have this big lump. They're sticking to each other, okay? Okay. Right. Now, as we have these aggregated platelets, so these platelets that have collected together, they're gonna be releasing uh, secretory products, right? So they're releasing chemicals out into the blood, okay? So these are gonna do a couple of different things. Um, two chemicals that we might know already because we've talked about them before as we talk about neurotransmitters, as we talk about uh, hormones, as we talk about the autonomic nervous system, our serotonin uh, and epinephrine. So epinephrine, we've talked about a lot. Serotonin just is a neurotransmitter, but also does lots of other things in your body. Okay. So both serotonin and epinephrine create vasoconstriction in your blood vessels, okay? So epinephrine, it's because when it's at uh, a high enough concentration, right, it can also bind to those alpha adrenergic receptors, create constriction in that smooth muscle, right? And the serotonin just has another pathway that, that lets it do this as well, okay? I actually don't know the specifics of exactly how serotonin does that, but they're working together here, okay? So our aggregated platelets are releasing serotonin and epinephrine okay, to continue that vasoconstriction that we started with the vascular spasm. And then they are also releasing chemicals that increase the stickiness to continue forming that plug, to continue collecting more and more platelets, as well as beginning the process of creating an actual blood clot. So our platelet plug is going to be different from a blood clot, okay? So after we walk through both, that will hopefully be obvious, um, but as, as you're sort of piecing together this information, I want you to know that now, okay? So these platelets that are collecting okay, are platelets that have aggregated into this group are releasing their different hormones. ADP, is the one that is increasing their stickiness to collect more and more platelets. So that's why you see this little, actually the green worked okay. 
this loop here, right? So what's the, this is saying to you is that those platelets that have collected together, the aggregated platelets are releasing ADP. ADP does a positive feedback loop and makes us collect more platelets, aggregate more and more platelets, making this plug bigger. Okay. So usually in AMP, we think about negative feedback loops, how we do something and then stop doing it. While we're trying to heal a wound, or heal a cut like this, or in technical terms, a laceration is a word for a cut, okay? We want positive feedback loop until we have actually covered this hole over, right? We wanna do this more and more and more. We wanna do this as quickly as we can uh, in order to stop that blood loss. So this is one of the examples of positive feedback that we see in ANP. Another one that we'll talk about uh, will be in our reproductive system. Usually, otherwise we're talking about negative feedback loops. So this ADP released by the platelets that are collecting makes us collect more platelets. So that's positive feedback. There are also gonna be chemicals that are facilitating blood coagulation. We'll talk about them as we talk about the blood clot, but I want to mention now while we're looking at these platelets, uh, thromboxane A2, okay? So thromboxane A2 is just another thing that these platelets are releasing, right? So the platelets are aggregating, they're releasing this thromboxane A2. It doesn't directly increase that platelet plug, right? Like it doesn't directly make the platelets more sticky, but it does just feed into this loop with the ADP, right? So the thromboxane A2 increases this positive feedback by increasing uh, this ADP essentially. So this is a kind of indirect way that we are again, creating a bigger and bigger platelet plug. Questions at this point? Right. So uh, as we're creating this platelet plug, we want to cover over the laceration, the cut, the hole in the blood vessel, but we don't actually want to just block the whole blood vessel forever, right? Like our goal is to create a seal just right here where our cut was, but we don't want a platelet plug spreading forever and ever out to the sides or building up onto the other side, blocking blood flow to everything downstream of this blood vessel. So we also have mechanisms that keep that platelet plug in place at the area of the cut. Okay. So we also prevent the spread of that platelet plug. And this is also uh, sort of important processes that we use to prevent clots from forming in healthy tissue when you don't have a cut, right? So if people have clotting issues, right, that puts you at risk for heart attack and stroke uh, as blood clots forming and then breaking off the walls, travel into areas and create blockages, right? So it's important that healthy blood vessels don't form plugs, okay? So we have two uh, different chemicals that help us do that, okay? So those are prostacyclin and nitric oxide. Okay, so PGI2 is going to be our abbreviation for prostacyclin. Nitric oxide, I think, is NO. Okay. So what's happening there is that when you don't have a cut, right, we don't have a cut, we're just going normal, everything's fine. The walls are always producing these two components, right? So PGI2 and nitric oxide, regardless of whether the abbreviation is actually NO, that's what I can get right, right? So NO, no blood clots, please, okay? Cool. So our healthy cells, the ones that are undamaged where we don't have exposed layers of other tissue are producing these two chemicals, which stop our platelets from sticking to those walls. Okay. We are gonna look at that in cartoon form as well. So the picture on the left was the one I was circling little bits for you to show you the different layers. So this is our normal, what's happening at our damaged blood vessel, okay? And on the right, we see what's happening when we have a normal undamaged blood vessel. Oh, good. That was right. And oh, perfect. All right. So here, we don't have any exposure of that subendothelium 
So we are not uh, having our von Willebrand factor sticking to those collagen fibers, right? So we're not creating any of those signals that started off the formation of our platelet plug. So not the adhesion, not the aggregation. And we also have uh, this inhibitory effect. So inhibit like to prevent, okay? So we're producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide from our healthy cells that just prevents platelet aggregation, right? So I'm saying no platelets, please. Now, in reality, right, if we put everything all together, this is going to keep that platelet plug right here at the location of the cut, because we might have this situation, right, happening at this cell, right, and this cell, right? So the undamaged sort of neighbors are preventing platelet plug adhesion, right? So that clot is going to stay right where we have the area of damage. That would be happening on the other side of the wall too, right? So that's going to help us keep that platelet plug contained to the area where we want. Questions right now? Cool. All right. So now we're going to move from our platelet plug to our blood clot. Okay. So we had our vascular spasm, clamp down that blood vessel, stop too much blood flow getting to that region. We had our platelet plug forming, which is uh, kind of like just like sort of putting your finger on the hole, right? But we actually want to heal it over. So we're gonna start to make a more permanent blood clot that's gonna have uh, this nice uh, sort of mesh-like structure that really seals over the region. Okay. So our platelet plug is just kind of a stopgap and we want actual clotting to happen to create a solid gel to, yeah, actually paste over this area. So when we talk about clotting, uh, another word we use is coagulation, right? So coagulation um, is just essentially another word for forming a clot, right? So coagulation is we're gonna have uh, these different materials coming together and forming this solid gel or clot. A clot is also called a thrombus, okay? Thrombus, okay. And that's worth knowing for the future because uh, you'll see conditions like thrombosis, right? Which is gonna refer to the formation of a thrombus, right? The formation of clots, right? So thrombus, important technical term. Cool. All right, so as we think about coagulation, this is gonna be happening in that same area where we just formed our platelet plug. This really is kind of a series of steps. Uh, so this is our dominant hemostatic defense mechanism, which is just to say that this is kind of the most important, kind of the most um, effective and long-term, right? Okay, so this is really what we're trying to go towards long-term, okay? So, we are going to have a, I'm going to flip you forward for a second and then come back to the slide. We're going to have a very big cascade that we're going to go through. So this is a whole coagulation pathway, our coagulation cascade. So what we're going to do is we're going to be building up from the most important part, which is the effect at the bottom, and then adding in, why did this happen? Okay. So I'm going to go back to that earlier slide, just letting you know where we're going. Uh -huh. Okay. So the most important thing to know, right? The first thing we wanna know is what we're actually trying to do, which is that we're trying to create a stable fibrin mesh. So fibrin is like a protein, a specific one. So we're trying to create a stable fibrin mesh, which is our clot or our thrombus, right? So the stable fibrin mesh, okay? To create this mesh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a precursor molecule called fibrinogen. It's gonna get converted first into a kind of loose mesh. So that's this second step before that loose mesh gets stabilized to fibrin. So right here, these are, you can just think of them as steps, right? One, two, three. I'm not gonna number stuff too often because we're adding in more and more information, um, but this is really happening in order. 
a note about the way things are named, because this will come up with other molecules in the future. When you say that, see this ending inogen or ogen on the end of things, um, that's often a sort of hint to you that this is going to be some kind of precursor molecule that is then going to get converted to something with a similar name. We're going to see this in the digestive system as well. So we're basically taking sort of like an inactive form of a molecule and activating it, which is why we see this kind of naming uh, convention or similarity. Okay, so fibrinogen will get converted to loose fibrin and then to a fibrin mesh. So we want to understand how that happens. Okay. So we can see that step at the bottom here. All right, so we are now trying to understand why did we take this inactive fibrinogen, create the loose mesh work, and then why did we stabilize it? Okay, so we're going to see a series of steps that lead us into that. Okay. So when you're looking at these figures, uh, just some notes, uh, when you see this kind of pale color, that is indicating to you that this is an inactive form of a molecule that we are activating later. Okay. Right. So we're starting with our fibrinogen. Okay. First, we want to convert it into this loose meshwork. Okay. The molecule that's gonna do that is something called thrombin. Okay. So we would say that thrombin converts fibrinogen to a loose fibrin meshwork or fibrinogen gets converted by thrombin or gets activated by thrombin, creating this loose fibrin meshwork. Okay. Next, we wanna take that loose meshwork and stabilize it, okay? So to stabilize it, we have this coagulation factor uh, XII, 13A, okay? I'm not going to ask you to memorize a lot of these, I, I will, pick out a couple coagulation factors for you to pick out. Uh, a thing to notice is that they did not number them in the order that they act. They just numbered our coagulation factors in the order that they discovered them, that they found them. So they're going to look like they're in a random order because they kind of are in a random order. Not, not random to the scientists, but random from the perspective of physiology. Okay. So what we can see happening here is that that thrombin converted fibrinogen to fibrin. And now this other factor, this factor 13A is converting the loose fibrin to the stabilized fibrin. What we would also notice is that in order to get this coagulation factor active, so the A here indicates it's active. So whenever you see this A active, versus we have inactive forms as well, okay? We can see that in order to activate this coagulation factor that stabilized our fibrin, thrombin activated that coagulation factor, okay? So I'm going to back up. As I said, I'm not gonna make you memorize all of these coagulation factors, which I'm not, okay? So we do wanna know fibrinogen converted to fibrin, converted to stable fibrin or clot. We wanna know that thrombin directly converts fibrinogen to the loose fibrin meshwork. I don't need you to know the number of this coagulation factor, but I do want you to know that thrombin indirectly stabilizes the meshwork, right? So it's directly converting our fibrinogen to fibrin. And then it takes two steps because it has to activate a coagulation factor in order to stabilize that mass work. So I'm gonna phrase, phrase this as kind of indirectly stabilizing that mesh work. Okay, so do know the name thrombin. Another thing to note about thrombin, okay, thrombin itself is not initially active, right? So thrombin begins as something that's circulating in your blood 
as something called prothrombin. So this is pale <laughs> because it's inactive. It does have a number, but because it's more important, it also has a name, All right? So we're just gonna go with the name. I don't care that you know that it's coagulation factor two. Okay, so prothrombin gets converted to thrombin in order to start this off. Okay. Now, what we are looking at here is something we call the intrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway is all happening due to this like local damage of the clot, okay? Yeah. We are also going to have uh, signals coming in from damaged tissue surrounding the blood vessel um, that also flow into this. Okay. If you need to, yeah, okay. What I am going to ask you to know from our numbered coagulation factors is this X, this factor 10. And the reason for that is that activating this. Uh, coagulation factor X, 10, is where we have both the signals from our extrinsic pathway and our intrinsic pathway kind of coming into play. So talking through this, I'm going to back up a, a little bit more about coagulation factors. Okay, so just a kind of overview of uh, what's going on here. In your blood, normally, you have all these inactive forms of your coagulation factors just like swimming around. So they're inactive, which is why they're not actively forming clots at the time. But when you have damage to the vascular tissue, right, and you have that exposure of all those layers, you start to have the platelet plug forming, have it starting to give off uh, its secretions. That's when uh, you start to get signals telling us to convert these circulating coagulation factors into their active forms to create the clot, okay? So the ones we want to know are, ultimately we're trying to figure out how we get the stabilized meshwork. So we wanna know the names of all the precursors here. We wanna know that we had to activate thrombin. And we wanna know that we did that with factor 10. So otherwise we wanna understand like the pathways kind of, but we can ignore a lot of the other names that we're gonna see. And we can kind of, uh, I'll jot down to myself to make a, a list of the specific ones I want you to know the names of if I haven't done that already. Okay. All right. So we are now zooming out a bit farther. So what we were just looking at, right? We started with the fact that we wanna understand how fibrinogen, ultimately becomes our stable clot, okay? So we looked at the fact that this is because we have a molecule called thrombin that started out as prothrombin that directly creates a loose meshwork and then indirectly stabilizes that clot, okay? All of this is a response to our coagulation factor 10, which is the joining point of extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. So I'm not gonna ask you to know the names or numbers of these factors that we see in the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, but I want you to understand conceptually what's happening there, okay? So conceptually, actually, let me progress forward, did I pull that out? Yeah, okay. It's the tool, okay. So conceptually, what we're looking at when we're looking at that intrinsic pathway, is just like when we had that platelet plug formation, that contact with the collagen in the subendothelial layer is activating a coagulation factor that ultimately flows us down to this bottom part, right? Okay. So if you wanted to learn it all, the cascade, we call this actually the coagulation cascade, if you hear about it in the future. Um, I've definitely seen TikToks about med students obsessively studying their coagulation cascades, right? So I'm not making you memorize the whole thing, but we do want to understand parts of it, right? So that in the future, as it becomes relevant to you, you can add on, okay? So what happens is that we have basically a series of molecules that are activating other molecules, right? So in the intrinsic pathway, it's intrinsic 
because it's responding locally to that damage right there, right there in the vasculature. So we had our coagulation factor come into contact with collagen. I'll read out the numbers to you. You don't need to know these numbers, right? But we activated an inactive coagulation factor 12. So it's now active. Once we've activated that coagulation factor, we then activate coagulation factor 11, right? We had an inactive form. It comes into contact with that active form of coagulation factor 12. Okay, so now we have an active coagulation factor 11. Then that activates coagulation factor nine. It needs calcium to do this. Okay. And then coagulation factor nine leads us into uh, that sort of merged pathway at the bottom that we focused in on at the beginning, right? Activates coagulation factor 10. It needs some other molecules in order to help it do this. And this ultimately leads into that conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, allowing us to directly convert fibrinogen into the loose fibrin network, meshwork, and then stabilize it indirectly. Okay. So basically, our coagulation cascade is just a series of dominoes, right? We activate one, it then activates the next one, activates the next one. We also have an extrinsic pathway. So conceptually, what's going on here when we're thinking about the extrinsic pathway, we have our blood vessel, okay? So this is our blood vessel. And when we were thinking about our net filtration pressures and tracking stuff, right? We were always looking at the fact that it's next to some tissue, right? And we had our interstitial fluid between. So what we're saying here with the extrinsic pathway, essentially, is that when you cut in and damage this blood vessel, you probably also damage some tissue to get to it, right? Your blood vessels aren't just like on the surface of your skin, right? They're not directly in contact with the air. So minimum, you cut your skin if you're coming from the outside. If you're inside the body and you had something coming from within your body, you probably also cut some tissue somewhere. So there are also signals that this tissue is giving out that is also telling us to form clots, right? So the tissue is sending out its own signals telling us to clot, mm -hmm. just my little signal symbol. Okay. So the extrinsic pathway has to do with the fact that that tissue is sending out messages, okay? So we're just gonna call those tissue factors. So for our purposes, just know that there's a tissue factor, it starts out inactive, then it gets activated, okay? And then it flows into that same pathway. So everything is converging at that coagulation factor 10, which is why that's the only numbered one I'm worried about you knowing, just because it's a joining point. So if we're gonna learn numbers for anything, pick that one. So these two pathways all come together, both that damage to the wall of the blood vessel and damage to the surrounding tissue. So intrinsic, if we're thinking about damage to the blood vessel, extrinsic, if we're thinking about damage to surrounding tissue, they activate this factor 10, converts prothrombin to thrombin. And we know that thrombin is super important for creating that stable meshwork because it directly converts fibrinogen to fibrin and then indirectly stabilizes the meshwork. Okay. So I know this is a lot. I just did a lot of talking. Um, questions at this point? This is something that it will be really helpful to you in some way. Try describing to each other or writing down in your own words, right? Um, I don't super recommend copying out this pathway without at least making like a lot of notes about what's going on um, because we want to be able to think about this pathway as we get towards our questions. Okay. So I think. We have some of this stuff just written out now, right? So our clotting factors are in the blood in their inactive form all the time, okay? They're coming from the liver, okay? They are getting activated by this coagulation cascade that we just ran through, right? So we have these things swimming around. We need to activate them when we need to use them and form a blood clot, right? Now, they're in the plasma. If we removed them all, we would refer to what we're left with of the plasma as serum. So if you 
I ever hear about blood serum. That's plasma without clotting factors, um, which you might need if you're uh, thinking about clotting disorders, right? And what you might need to give people. Okay. There are other substances that you need for clot formation. Um, don't necessarily need you to memorize these, but do know that you need other things in order to kind of help, right? Like kind of assist along uh, at certain parts of these pathways, All right? So know that some of them are ions, some of them are coming from platelets. That's the kind of level of detail I think is important for us for right now. So there are also factors that stop us from forming clots, right? So we don't always want to form clots. We do want to sometimes stop forming clots. And if we are forming clots inappropriately or too much or too big clots, then we are at risk of a lot of diseases because clots can break off of walls and go plug little tiny blood vessels elsewhere, causing heart attacks, causing strokes, causing pulmonary embolisms. It's a problem. Okay. So there are other proteins in your plasma called anticoagulants. Uh, that prevent or limit clot formation. They are also on the surface of the endothelial cells. Healthy tissue um, secretes inhibitory factors, right? So there are, uh, just like when we were looking at that nitric oxide uh, coming out of our healthy endothelial cells, stopping us from forming uh, more platelet plugs, we also have a tissue factor pathway inhibitor, inhibiting that extrinsic pathway. So our healthy endothelial cells are also stopping us from activating those tissue factors that would otherwise uh, activate these clotting factors. Okay. And we also have a molecule called thrombomodulin secreted by our healthy endothelial cells that also stops us from creating clots. So the thrombomodulin binds to the thrombin. We know thrombin is super important because it's doing the main job of that little pathway at the bottom. It's the one that's converting the fibrinogen to the fibrin then stabilizing it. So if we can basically inactivate the thrombin, we are going to stop clotting. So thrombomodulin can do that, um, does that by activating something called protein C. So we will start out with dissolving blood clots next time. Dissolving blood clots is quite simple, but we'll, we'll pick up here on Friday.